Hi guys, um, it's 12.35 in the morning and I've been working all day because my OCD prevents me from not working at all. So if, right now I have the logic of a drunken sailor. So if I say something completely stupid, I apologize in advance. So right now, after reviewing federalism and the interaction among state level and local level, in addition to with the federal government, we also looked at all three branches of government in addition to the essentially the fourth branch, which is the bureaucracy, which is a subdivision essentially of the executive. Um, but now we're going to look at heavily the Bill of Rights in addition to the 14th Amendment and how those things enabled people's rights to be protected. And so we're going to start here uh, with comparing and mostly contrasting this idea of civil liberties versus civil rights. So civil liberties are simply those that are deemed natural rights, as in the Bill of Rights. So they ensure that you have access to your life, liberty, and then your pursuit of happiness or property. All right, so these are all things that are found in the Bill of Rights that protect these rights of the citizens, and they keep the government out of people's lives so that it's not oppressive. So before we go to civil rights, I'm just going to take you quickly through the Bill of Rights. So as you know, I'm sure so many of you are familiar by now with the First Amendment. Now, we think of freedom of speech, obviously, but there are five other things. So the main ones that we're going to talk today are probably going to be press, speech, and religion, but there's also assembly and petition that you have the freedoms to. We're also going to talk heavily about the Second Amendment, which is the right to bear arms. And in these cases, the courts often and pretty much most definitely ruled in favor of individuals over state regulations of these things. We also have the Third Amendment, um, which was kind of a mockery at the British Quartering Act. We have the Fourth Amendment, which we'll also talk about, which is no unreasonable searches and seizures. You need a search warrant before just invading someone's house and taking things. And there's the exclusionary rule in the Fourth Amendment that if you find evidence, but you didn't go through the proper process under the Fourth Amendment and you didn't get a warrant, that evidence can't be used in court. And the Fifth Amendment comes from uh, Miranda v. Arizona. And we'll talk about this later. In addition to the right to remain silent, there's also some other pretrial rights like no double jeopardy. And we'll, and there's also the due process clause, which would apply to the federal government. But we'll, we'll get more into that later. The Sixth Amendment, you'll also see pop up um, in Gideon v. Wainwright to have access to a lawyer despite financial background. And that is mostly the sixth amendment mostly focuses on right to a fair and speedy trial in criminal cases and so the seventh amendment we're not we don't really talk a whole lot about in this video but that's just a right to a jury in a trial of a civil case and the eighth amendment is no excessive bail no cruel or unusual punishments and we will also talk about that a little bit later the ninth amendment we're we're not going to talk about that a whole lot, but we do talk about the Tenth Amendment heavily in Unit 1, where we talk about federalism and giving states powers. So, you're going to notice we have 27 amendments. This here is just the Bill of Rights. So, in my Quizlet, I attached the rest of the amendments if you were curious to kind of further understand our Constitution. So now that you understand what civil liberties are and you can connect it right to the Bill of Rights, I'm going to go back and explain to you what civil rights are. So rights of individuals are, well, civil rights are rights of individuals against discrimination based on race, national origin, religion, sex, identity, all that stuff. And even pregnancy and abortion rights and privacy in terms of Roe v. Wade and... um 
some Planned Parenthood cases and the Griswold case and all those that we'll talk about. And so these are different than civil liberties in the sense that they are more targeted on these themes here that are more implicitly brought together in the Constitution. And a lot of times these will be in conflict with states. So the 14th Amendment's due process clause will often apply the due process clause of the fifth clause of the fifth fifth amendment to from the federal to the states through the 14th so we'll see a lot of these bill of rights civil liberties be applied in civil rights cases so we'll get into that also a little bit more as we go through this so i'm just going to start with the first amendment now our first amendment right we we did talk about that a little bit And we are going to start with some serious cases on separation of church and state. Now, people who were very Christian, very religious, and wanted to establish a religion for the new country of the United States of America saw people like Thomas Jefferson as atheists because they wanted a wall of separation between church and state. Now, the reason that a lot of these aristocratic framers wanted this was because it would be hypocritical of them to establish essentially an official church because that was what was going on back in England that a lot of people living in America had basically fled from and were being persecuted against. So they came to the United States in hoping to practice freedom of religion. And that is a story for another time, but if you want to look into the Pilgrims and many other groups like the Quakers, that is a very big influence. This has a very big influence on groups like them. So, within the First Amendment, there is an establishment clause, and that clause states that the government, as I said, cannot, cannot establish an official religion at all. And in that same, same amendment, we're also going to examine the free exercise clause, and that is within the freedom of religion subdivision. And that means that the president or the government cannot force you to go to church or engage in religious activities that may or may not be, quote unquote, involuntary or quote unquote, voluntary and cause pressure. So we're going to actually look at, we're going to look at two major cases. We're going to look at Wisconsin v. Yoder, and we're going to look at Angle v. Vital. The Lemon Test here we'll also talk about, that's from the court case Lemon v. Kurtzman. And you can look into that more on your own, but this is the more important precedent that came out of it. So Angle v. Vital was Basically, a case where there were um, essentially like schools were leading prayers, and this was making students uncomfortable. And so, parents brought forth the suit, and eventually, it reached the Supreme Court. And under the establishment clause, you you can't be establishing essentially a religion, and you can't be establishing practices that go with that religion to essentially kind of alienate other students who may not share your same beliefs. And that would go against their own freedom of religion. And we'll also see this then later in the Lemon Test, which in my quizlet I'll go through the steps of the Lemon Test. There are three, and it will show you how you determine whether something violates the Establishment Clause. And it all starts with determining whether it has a secular purpose and whether it advances or inhibits religion, because if it enhances or inhibits religion, it's unconstitutional. But if it does not, it is constitutional. If it has a clear secular purpose, it is constitutional. So we'll, you can look at that on your own time. I think just knowing in general that this w- this became the test of the Establishment Clause is what is most important. And so, as I mentioned, we have the Free Exercise Clause, and this also... You can see that in an instance where basically three um, Amish students 
were withheld from going to the eighth grade and their families were fined. But a group on behalf of those families um, appealed and, well, brought forth their case and eventually went to the Supreme Court. And they basically were saying it wasn't right for those families to be fined because in the Amish culture, as expressed by their own religion, like going to school and going to a very secular school or going to a school that would expose them to certain ideals could tear them away from their culture. And so the Supreme Court decided that, yes, that is true. And they ruled in favor of the Amish students under the free exercise clause. So they, can't, they don't have to go to high school. And they don't have to stay in school until they're 16. All right, so this all here was the um, freedom of religion portion of our First Amendment, but there's also many freedom of speech cases. And I think it's important to note, because people think that they can say whatever they want, not all speech is protected. Like, for example, during wartime, your speech might be restricted so as to avoid you inciting violence against the government during a time that would um, initiate clear and present danger. And you'll see, you'll see this in terms of Shank v. U.S. Also, um, obscenity is just a no-no. So if you're just being lewd and... Yeah, you, you can't do that. Unless you're, like, apparently, like a really fa famous artist, then it's fine. But, you know. And also, um, you can't incite illegal activity. You can't just go conjure up a mob of people that are angry about the Democrats in office and start burning a bunch of office buildings. That That's not good freedom of speech. You can get arrested for that. Not only because of what you said, but also because you destroyed some federal property. So... There's that. And so you're going to see the right to assembly, the right to petition here. A lot of these end up going hand in hand. And when people assemble, they're often exercising this broader concept of having freedom of speech to express themselves. So a lot of these things became intermingled in just terms of expression. So we did talk about freedom of speech, and I think one interesting thing that was brought up in Khan Academy actually was this idea that if you're working at a private institution and you say something that the head of that institution does not like, you can be fired and you can't sue. But if it's public, you can sue, but you're not necessarily guaranteed to win. And what I mean by that is you could lose on the grounds that you had defamed that institution. So now we're going to get into defamation because this is a form of speech that is not protected. So that is the act of damaging someone or some institution's rep reputation by making false statements. And this could be either written through libel or this could be in the form of verbal speech through slander. Now, I kind of want to go back to obscenity not really because it's interesting, just because Justice Potter Stewart had a really funny quote during the low point of them trying to, well, the Supreme Court trying to define what they saw as obscenity. So Justice Potter Stewart said, I, I know it when I see it, you know, so <laughs> that kind of just brought light to the whole situation. So... I think you heard me a little bit ago start mentioning as because not all speech is protected, I mentioned Shank versus the United States. So Shank versus the United States was basically where um, this man, uh, along with another person, a female actually, her name was Elizabeth, I can't remember her last name, but they were, they were distributing basically speech that would discourage people and build anti-war sentiment and 
Basically, the Supreme Court decided that this was creating clear and present danger during a really precarious time, and that's not protected by the First Amendment. So the order of society was then favored over the individual freedom of being against the war. Now, you might be thinking, well, that's weird, because, like, we can complain about the Vietnam War whenever we want now, and not get put in jail or get fined or get hushed by the government. And that's true because there isn't a clear and present danger of having anti-war sentiment and having a public that might rise against the government during a precarious time. All right. So this whole prior idea of prior restraint is going to also come up. So Like we were saying, that's government censorship of free expression by preventing speech, in in this case, or publication from happening in the first place. Now, here's where we're going to get into publication. Now, freedom of the press is something that is very important to uh, American society. So, basically, in New York Times versus the United States... New York Times had gotten its hands on the Pentagon Papers and published the first chapter, and Nixon wanted to make sure that the rest of the chapters were not published. So, he basically sued on the same grounds as this whole idea here that the, um, that New York Times, by releasing these Pentagon Papers, would cause... A serious issue in terms of danger and security and keeping chaos in order. And, but the Supreme Court decided that prior restraint, as we talked about here, was unconstitutional. They can't be hushed, especially considering what had occurred and what was being revealed had already happened. So they weren't at risk, essentially. They were just revealing historical fact that had been hushed up for a while. And so, the you see, I, I keep scrolling back here because I want you to see that there's a difference. Social order was valued over individual freedom here. But freedom of the press was valued over social order and keeping the status quo in terms of calmness. And so... Now I'm going to get into some other interesting things. So sadly, I did not add the flag burning case on here, but you'll see that I believe in my Quizlet. And flag burning is a type of symbolic speech. And that type of speech is more metaphorical and is protected by the First Amendment. And a lot of them are actions, like I said, like burning a flag or wearing like arm wristbands, which you see in this case here and in this case that's where symbolic speech was protected and that's all you really want to remember out of this one but the history behind it is also interesting and it's available like i said in my quizlet um this case just kind of bothers me uh because i had a flashback to uh ap gov when i was sitting there and i got really distracted and tried to come up with names to remember all of these things and this one I had a really easy time remembering because in my head I said Miller stop your Californication and because of that I did not have a hard time remembering what the case was about so I apologize if that's permanently burned in your mind but I thought I'd share it because you won't forget what the case is about. And so basically it just says obscene materials are not protected under the First Amendment. That's just there. Well, there you go. I'm not gonna. I think I already butchered that one up enough, you know. So we're not going to take the time and go back in time and revisit Gutenberg. I'm sorry, Gutenberg. Your printing press is nice, but I don't have time for you. So we're going to go on to the Second Amendment and call it... Okay, enough for the First Amendment. So the Second Amendment was born out of the Battle of Lexington and Concord, where basically the British arm British soldiers disarmed colonists, 
And so the colonists don't like that. So Second Amendment, bam. And now it's interpreted as the right for individuals to have self-defense. So these guns will protect them in their homes. And so McDonald v. Chicago is not the only case you're going to see on this. We will talk about another one, I believe, in my quizlet. I'm going to scroll through here because I want to see if it's... Did I put it in here? I apologize for the pause. No, I didn't put it in here. Well, it's probably not that important. So we're just going to focus on this one case here. Um, basically, with this case, it decided that through the Fourth Amendment's due process clause that applied the due process clause of the Fifth Amendment, therefore, through the Fourteenth Amendment, Fourteenth Amendment's due process clause, the Second Amendment of the Bill of Rights that applied to the federal government could now be applied to the states. So, so Illinois and, well, specifically Chicago could could not say you can't have you cannot bear arms. Because old McDonald wanted to shoot some pigs. And yeah, I'm just going to leave that one there. Because that that just describes my mental state right now. I am so tired. <laughs> okay. So it's not that I don't care about balancing individual freedom with public order and safety. That sounds all nice and good. And John, you're probably right. It might be on the exam. And that's why I can't skip it and make some sad excuse to. So we're going to go over it relatively quickly. I talked about the Fourth Amendment, which means that in order for police to obtain a search warrant, they need probable cause or if they need to investigate your car, your car or something and they pull you over, they need reasonable suspicion. So if you're just like, I don't know, you're high or something and you're like driving like a weirdo and they're like, oh, that doesn't look normal. They pull you over and you smell funny and they want to search your car. They have reasonable suspicion there. So like, I'm not, you know what? I'm going off on a tangent. You get the idea. But... In the Fourth Amendment, if you do not follow this process of getting a warrant to just randomly go into someone's home, well, it's not random, but it adds hyperbolic effect, I suppose. If you go into someone's house without a warrant and you start searching for things and you find things that supports the case and helps you reach a conclusion, you might not be able to con include it in court unless it's endangering the public safety through this exclusionary rule that says you have to follow these Fourth Amendment um, processes. So the Eighth Amendment is personally my favorite. Not the excess excessive bail part, but the cruel and unusual punishment part. I, I just, that stuck with me as a kid. Ever since middle school, I like that wording. Which is probably concerning. But it, it just means that if you commit a crime and say it's like a minor crime, you can't be executed like you might have been back in, I don't know, Great Britain where the king might have decided, oh, I don't like you and this is a petty crime for stealing a wee loaf of bread. So now I will chop your head off. Bye bye. And that's another rant of mine making this video excessively longer than it needs to be. So next up is selective incorporation, and we actually kind of talked about this through McDonald v. Chicago. So through the 14th Amendment that guarantees due process and also equal protection, which is for later, due process is something that originated in the 5th Amendment to apply to the federal government. But due process in the 14th Amendment applies that to the states, so the states have to follow the Bill of Rights. So selective incorporation is... The process over time where the Supreme Court has approved and applied some of the protections of the Bill of Rights, the states justified by the Due Process Clause in this 14th Amendment. So some rights in the Bill of Rights they found are applicable to the states through this clause. And so I think that sums that up well enough. Um, also, we have the Fifth Amendment that originated through Miranda v. Arizona, and that's another interesting case. 
Um, but now police officers are required to say you have the right to right to remain silent. But that's not the only right that you have under the Fifth Amendment. These are pre-trial rights. And basically, you can't be tried for the same qu- crime twice. And as I said, you can't self-incriminate. And also, due process originated here. And that's later applied to the states through the 14th Amendment. Also, we have the fun Sixth Amendment. So that's for, um, gives rights to defendants in criminal cases. So it's got to be speedy in public trial, get rights to that impartial jury. And you have rights to a lawyer and you have to know what charges are being brought against you. And so in Gideon v. Wainwright, Originally, Gideon was a poor man and he couldn't afford a lawyer, so he lost the case. But he was appointed with a lawyer and ended up winning his case. But the important thing here was he was given a lawyer because the Supreme Court determined that through the Due Process Clause, as written in the 14th Amendment, the 6th Amendment and the Bill of Rights could be applied to the states, and therefore Gideon was entitled to have a lawyer to protect him. And in other words, that right to protect him is the right to legal counsel. And I mentioned earlier Griswold v. Connecticut. That established the first rights of women to their privacy in terms of um, pregnancy rights, I suppose. Um, This basically just granted the right of using contraception. And now that might seem strange because... Well, society has changed in terms of its attitudes towards things like that. But we certainly still have people in society that even think that this is wrong. So that's their interpretation. And so um, several years later, we also got the case, case Roe v. Wade, which basically extended the right to privacy to a woman's body. Um, and said that they can have an abortion. And that was their right to privacy. So that right that was granted through the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment was extended to the first trimesters of pregnancy. All right, so now we're going to look at some civil rights movements because all of that was mostly civil liberties, if you think about it, because the 14th Amendment is being used to apply the Bill of Rights. All right, so... This clause of equal protection was the second clause that we didn't talk as much about. We talked more about the Due Process Clause, but the Equal Protection Clause is just as important because it allows... Basically, the government is not allowed to deny people equal protection. So this is interpreted in a variety of different ways and serves as a check against discrimination and prejudice against many different types of people. And so one early instance of, well, I guess it's not an early instance, but it's one instance that really started kicking off the civil rights movement was the letter from Birmingham jail. So Martin Luther King was arrested, believe it or not, in 1963. And he wrote a letter that says that his people have the right to practice civil disobedience and they should not have to keep waiting and experiencing things like police brutality and losing people that they care about. Just to believe in this idea that suddenly, after centuries, it'll suddenly go away. So. That's the argument he makes in Letter from a Birmingham Jail. And John has some other uh, notes attached about that in the printouts that are quite interesting. I enjoyed reading the quotes. All right, so we talked a little bit about the civil rights movement. Uh, Martin Luther King was certainly a leader in that. Um, And that was in the hopes of ending segregation and other forms of discrimination against African-American citizens. One sec. <coughs> oh boy. I need water or something. So, 
the Civil Rights Act here, we're going to talk about two acts. We're going to talk about the Voting Rights Act, and we're going to talk about the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So this prohibited discrimination on the basis of race, color, sex, religion, or national origin. And it also leveled the playing field for employment. All right, so the Voting Rights Act was when essentially uh, African Americans were granted suffrage. Also, you're going to see some other um, movements going on here. We have the National Organization for Women that seeks uh, to advance the rights of women. Uh, and, but we also have a pro-life anti-abortion movement going on. Um, and that's basically what it says in the name. The, and I'm not going to go into that without getting political. So we're just going to leave it there. So we talked about um, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So there can't be any racial discrimination. There can't be any grandfather clauses, poll taxes, literary t literacy tests, etc. None of that anymore. So we're just going to take some time instead to talk about this um, interesting relationship between Plessy versus Ferguson and Brown v. Board, Board of Education. In 1896, um, Plessy was a man who was one-eighth African-American, so he sat in a white-only car, and he ended up getting arrested, but he did this just to kind of test a theory. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said that it was, it was constitutional for him to be arrested in that way. It's constitutional for people to be separated based on race, as long as they got equal treatment. And hence came this idea of separate but equal. Now... You might be sitting there like, well, it wasn't equal. Yeah, we know that. This was just them covering their asses, for lack of a better term. And also, it's like 1.07 a.m. And my mind is like kind of a mush ball. Anyways, moving on. This precedent of separate but equal was overturned in Brown v. Board of Education after Oliver Brown uh, took his case um to to court because his daughter linda had to walk to a segregated school and it wasn't safe and there wasn't really any reason for it he felt the institution wasn't equal it was separate that's for sure but it wasn't equal and so the supreme court was forced to revisit this topic of segregation over 50 years later and they decided unanimously to reverse the separate but equal idea because separate is inherently unequal and it's inconsistent with the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. And, well, segregation was wrong in principle to begin with and that shouldn't be occurring. So, and you might be thinking, well, yay, this is such a victory for the civil rights movement. And yeah, it was. But um, if you go back to the previous videos, um, I talked a little bit about a Southern Manifesto and ways in which um, states were not enforcing this decision and they were still segregating anyway, especially Virginia. Virginia was very guilty of this. And also um, one um, thing here is Title IX and we... As female students, we look at this as kind of the pivotal moment for, beyond the 19th Amendment, but the pivotal moment for, you know, girls in school to start being given the chances that they need for equal education and equal opportunities, especially like in things like athletics. So the funding that they need um, is finally being given to them. So... You can skip this part, but I'm going to tell like a quick mini story about my mother. So when she was in middle school, she played on a softball team until basically she got older and there started to run out of opportunities for her. There were only a couple girls who would play and there wasn't a lot of people who wanted to coach girls and the league was really small and 
they lost all of their games except for one, and they really struggled because no one would pay attention to them. But they called themselves the Liberated Ladies because there weren't many other women like them and other girls like them that were taking that chance during that time period. And my mom remembers this one girl who was a foreign exchange student but had come to eventually live in America. She was used to playing soccer all the time in her native country. And if you want me to say football, I'm not going to because I don't have a British accent. But she came and she couldn't find any teams that would take her because she was female, even though she was good. And so she decided to end up joining that softball team because that was all she could find. So Title IX was such a huge victory for that generation and the generation coming now. And so here is this idea of minority and majority rights. So how are you supposed to make sure that everyone's happy and instances of that are not so clear cut? And I get into that in my closet. I'm not going to go through that here. I especially talk about this in Shaw v. Reno, but I'm not doing that here, guys. I'm sorry. I just don't want to keep you guys too long. So the last thing we're going to talk about is affirmative action before I mentally crash and go to sleep. So affirmative action is highly contested because some people say that it's reverse discrimination and other people say that it's giving people that have long been discriminated against and long have been disadvantaged the proper opportunities that they need to be successful. So affirmative action, um, just in essence, is improving opportunities for underrepresented or disadvantaged groups, especially in relation to employment or education. Now, in some instances, this had evolved into quota systems where African-American students and other minorities were being preferred over, say, white students. And that's not legal at all anymore, and if that if quota systems can be proven in that matter that they're actually disadvantaging other people, then they're unconstitutional, but they can essentially affirmative actions in schools are okay if they're just for the purpose of trying to give people the opportunities that they need as well as say they're trying to create a diverse student body and through doing so, they would like to have other minorities making up their uh, student population. Now, this affirmative, affirmative action belief is held by certain people, yes, but the, another, the other side of the aisle believes that the Constitution is colorblind to begin with, so none of this affirmative action is necessary. With all of the amendments, with all of the written uh, articles, they believe that citizens of all races are already protected equally, so why would they need extra benefits? And so that's one way that you can look at the highly contested affirmative action and decide for yourself how you feel about it. And so that's going to be all, folks, for today. I will tell you, with my blood, sweat, and tears, and also more tears. I finished unit three, finally. Um, if it will load. So I'm sorry this one's a bit longer. There was a lot of court cases in this unit I wanted to cover, and I also added some other things you might not need, but if you, if you check it out, it should probably help you a lot. It really goes through everything. There's some really good interactive questions. And as always, if you have questions for me, just let me know. All right, guys. So really, really good luck to you guys tomorrow. Gotta say, like, the fact that the AP test is tomorrow is kind of hitting me hard right now. It's, I mean, I guess technically it's today because it's 1.14 a.m., but you get the idea. So I will stop annoying you guys and if you're awake, get some sleep. If you're not awake and you see this tomorrow and you're like, what is she talking about? I'm sorry, I should have waited to record this tomorrow. So good night, guys. Good morning. Not sure. <laughs>